the second chapter, we're going to talk about the church at Pergamos, beginning in verse 12. Jesus, speaking here, He says to the angel of the church in Pergamos, Write, These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. Jesus speaking here. The church at Pergamos was a church that evolved out of Ephesus. Uh, there's really no historic timeline as to when it actually started, but this church was established in Pergamos, and Pergamos was a place that had a lot of educated people. They had over 200 parchments in their library. That was a lot of written material. Now these people, when they didn't have nothing else to do, they went to the library. I'm married to a librarian, just to let you know that. I know what they do. And whenever you go around anywhere, you're with the librarian, it's like being married to a rock star. Everybody knows the librarian, and that's the guy that was with him, with her. But anyway, the library of Pergamos, with over 200 parchments, written pieces of paper, papyrus in that time was, was very scarce. So it was, it was a highly regarded area. The temple of Zeus was there. And we will talk about that in a few minutes. Uh, one of the things that uh, Paul uh, or that John talks about here is the seat of Satan. We're not going to get into that right now because we're going to talk about this in a few minutes. Zeus was there, but the god of healing, Escapulus, he was also there. Uh, how many of you have ever been to a doctor? <laughs> okay, I knew I knew that would hit right there. All right. Have you ever seen this little uh, sign that they have on the door there? They have doctor and then they have two entwined serpents with a sword or, or a staff in there. That's the picture of a scapulus. A scapulus was a god that they worshipped. And in his temple, one of the things that the worshippers did was that they would go in there making sacrifices for healing, wanting healing. But one of the things that they would do is that they would spend the night there. They would sleep there. Okay, this is first level hospital, okay? But the thing that they were looking for to happen was that the serpents, non-poisonous serpents, lived in this temple. They would ask a scapulist that these serpents would come by and actually slither up to them. Now, won't that make you sleep good at night? <laughs> yeah, you'll wake up to, in the morning about 2 o'clock. Some of you will have bad dreams tonight. It's a ministry of discouragement. But anyway, he says, the, These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. Jesus Christ is the Word of God. All right. He deals with the Word of God out of his mouth. And this is a picture. If you look in Hebrews, the fourth chapter, verses 12 and 13, it talks about the Word of God that pierces it cuts both ways when it goes in. There's never a dull edge on the sword of God. God's Word is not dull in any point. It accomplishes exactly what He wants it to accomplish. And when it comes into your life or into my life, or in this case into the church at Pergamos, it starts separating people. It gets into where I can't get, where the preacher can't get, where the song director can't get. God's Word goes right to the heart of the issue. In Hebrews 4.13, it says that it lays bare <coughs> all things. The picture of laying bare is the picture of the sacrificial animal. Now, I don't know how many of y'all are hunters and have killed deer and you've had to cut their throats or, or in some cases other animals that you may have had to cut, your, cut their throats. The first thing you do when you cut an animal's throat is you bend it backwards like that and you expose this right here and you cut it. That's the picture of what the sword, the Word of God, does. It lays bare everything. Everything that's in the heart, everything that's in the mind, everything that you've done, everything that we think. And the church at Pergamos was being dealt with by Jesus Christ, the living Word of God. And He was taking the spoken Word of God and He was piercing their lives and their hearts and their intentions. 
and every detail. <laughs> Jesus, I know thy works. Where you dwell, even where Satan's seed is, and thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas, Antipas my faithful, was my faithful martyr who was slain among you where Satan dwells. The picture of Zeus's temple, many commentators believe, is the picture of what John was talking about here. Because of the way it was made, it's 120 foot by 100, 111 foot or 112 foot, and then it's 18 feet high. It actually looks like a big seat. Many of the commentators believe that's what John was referring to. Right there at that point, Antipas was martyred. Historians tell us that he was martyred by being roasted in a bull, a brass bull. Now when they do that, what they do, they put you in there, they close the bull and they build a fire under it. And when that fire finally consumes your body, your body turns into a vapor and vapor has to escape and so it would go out through the mouth and through the nostrils of the bull just like a, just like a whistling tea kettle. The only difference was it would make a boah sound like that. That's the way many commentators and historians believe Antipas died. He would not relegate to the Roman emperor. It was required of the citizens at Pergus to go and place a piece or a small amount of, it was called a tribute. Some places called it a tax, but here it was called a tribute. They would take it and it was just a little piece of incense or a little amount of incense and drop it on the altar of the emperor and say, Caesar is Lord. Most historians believe that Antipas said, I ain't going to do that. Now people, like we've talked about in here before, there's a lot of us that have been inconvenienced, but none of us in here have suffered to blood. These people were dying. These people were dying. Antipas, he stood up and he said, nope. And some, some historians actually believe he was the preacher of the church there. He stood up and said, no, nah, I ain't going to submit to that. You see, right now we have a sword hanging over our church and every church in these United States that have refused to do what the government says do. And there may be a point where our pastor or this associate pastor has to step up and say, No, I ain't going to do that. And our Cary Association minister, Dr. Baker, told us earlier this year that he very well expects within a year that there will be preachers in the Louisiana Baptist Convention in jail for refusing to do those things. Now, we may not have to die. We just may have to give up everything we own. Kind of like Brother Allen talked about this morning. But there were some in that church that said, Oh, let's make everybody feel comfortable. Let's, let's just do whatever everybody else does and it's okay because God will understand that because maybe they'll come to our church and they'll hear the gospel. I want to tell you something while I'm up here and it's probably on tape. It'll get, it'll get in the podcast, I'm sure. I really don't care if lost people come in here and are comfortable. I want them to know they're loved, but I want them to hear the truth. And the truth is that they're sinners. And Jesus Christ died for their sins. He rose again. And if they place a living faith in Him and embrace everything that He is and give them everything, give Him everything that they are, that they can live forever with Him. And he, they, God will give them a life that is on the next level. Amen. It's called being born again. That's what it is. I, I'm going to be quite honest with you. I don't care. If you're lost, we want you here. We love you. We want you. But I also want to tell you that you're going to die and go to hell if you don't get Jesus. Amen. 
Is that plain, brother? Okay, all right. I just want to make sure. Is it, does anybody understand where I stand on this? Just want to let you know that. In verse 14, but I have a few things against you. Oh, well, what would those things be? Just a couple of things. Now, this is Jesus talking. I have a few things against you because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. Balaam. Balaam is one of the names we hold up as an apostate. Just want to let you know that. The New Testament talks about him in another spot, and I think it's in Jude, where it says that if you want to see a false teacher, look at him. We have what is called in the New Testament church today, right here in this area, a movement, for lack of a better term, that is called Progressive relativism. You relate to lost people. You relate to them. You bring them into the church. You play the kind of music they want to hear. You do the things that they want you to do. You let them dictate the worship. I'm going to tell you something. Are you listening good? God don't honor that because they're not His people. We are His people. And God demands holiness. He demands righteousness. The name that we sang a while ago, Jesus. Jesus is a picture of holiness and righteousness. That's who He is. And when we bring people into this place, I want them to come in here. I want them to understand we love them. I want them to understand we embrace them and we want them in our church. But we also want to tell them that if you don't get Jesus, you're going to be lost. You can sit in these pews, you can holler amen, you can turn flips up and down the, all, all the rows in here and everything else. But if you don't leave that lifestyle, you're going to die and go to hell. What was happening in this church, there was a group of them that said, look, we'll, just, we'll get them all in here and they'll just, they'll, they'll just associate with us and everybody will be happy. Can't we just get along? No. My God does not tolerate sin. And Jesus said, I'm coming at you with a sword, a double-edged sword. And I'm going to find out where you stand on this. You see, there was a remnant in that church that stood up and said, we can't have that here. But there was another group, and it was a large group, that said, oh, well, we'll just, just bring them on in, just let them on in. I even know, and I'm going to start meddling right here. I even know a church in this area that will give the Lord's Supper to lost people. It's a Baptist church. I'm getting mad now, but I'm telling you. Not only will they be condemned, but they're bringing condemnation on those people that are taking that. My Bible says, with Paul writing to the Corinthians, he said, you make sure you take it and you take it justified. You don't, when you eat it and drink it and you're not clean, it is the Lord's Supper. It's not Mike's. It's not Brother Allen's. It's the Lord's Supper. It's not even Eastridge's Supper. It's the Lord's Supper. And when you embrace people and tell them, we want you to be comfortable, just come on in here and take it, and, and we'll just all be happy and everything else, you are leading them down the path to hell. And you will be held accountable. Jesus says it in this passage right here. I hope y'all don't get upset, but that's the way it is. Taught Balak to cast a stumbling block. A stumbling block is a trap. I don't know how many of y'all have engaged in trapping. I did years ago. You hide traps. If you take a trap and you lay it out on the ground, guess what's going to happen? Nothing. You have to set it. You have to take it and you spring it and you have, to, you have to prepare the trap. You don't just go down and buy a trap and you go walk out in the woods and you set it and throw it down. You have to boil it. You have to prepare it. You have to spring it so when the, when the trap snaps shut, it doesn't cut the animal's leg off. It traps them. 
Okay, are y'all following me? You see, if it, if it closes solidly, what's going to happen? It's going to pinch the animal's leg off and the animal's going to be able to get away. But if it's sprung just a little bit and it closes down to like a sixteenth of an inch or an eighth of an inch, all it's going to do is pinch the animal's arm or leg or whatever's in it and they're going to drag it and try to get away. You hide the trap. You don't just lay it out on a log. You take and you cut a little notch here and a little notch there and you move a little bit out of there and you put the trap down and you cover it up and it's been scented and everything else. And then you know what you do as a good trapper? You put a limb on this side and a limb on this side. You know why? Because as that coon or that bobcat walks that log across that creek or across that low spot, they're going to be watching that stick because that stick don't look right. It's laying. There's something about that stick that just don't look right. And so what they're going to do, they're going to see the stick there and they're going to step over it. And what, what happens? The trap gets them. This is the picture of what Balaam did. This is a picture of what happens to the church of God when they begin to compromise. And they set up a relative, a relativity to the people around them. I want people to look at this church and see it as a lighthouse. And when they come in here, I want them to be confronted with God's Word. And the fact that if they die, they're going to go to hell if they don't get Jesus Christ. This is a picture of an Old Testament. Let me, let me read the next thing here. Verse 15. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Now, I don't want to be a part of anything that God don't like, but I certainly don't want to be a part of anything that He hates. This is Jesus. That's pretty plain, ain't it? The doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Now, what is that? Well, Nicolaitans, when you look at the root word, is ruling of the people or rulers of the people. Now, I'm going to tell you something here and then I'm going to tell you what I think. There are a lot of preachers and there are a lot of Bible students that go immediately to the Catholic Church and say, this is what the Catholic Church is. The Catholic Church didn't, didn't exist at this time. Okay, let me, let me back up and tell you again, because that's a good place for an amen. The Catholic Church didn't exist at this time. Amen. We have seen these deeds already at Ephesus. Look back, at your, look back at your Bible, and you can see at the church at Ephesus, they were deeds. Now they're doctrines. You see, when we entertain things that aren't in Scripture, they have a tendency to take a hold in, in the church. Why? Satan. He's got that trap set. He's got that trap. He's got it all set up for us because it sounds so good. Brother Mike, just think about how many people we could get to join this church if they didn't have to come down to the front right here. Think about how many people we could get if we sent them to the back. Uh, you and several people could be back there and you could talk to them. And then at the end of the month, we would just present them in a business meeting. And they wouldn't even have to be here. We could just take their cards or their names and present them to the church. Doesn't that sound like a great idea? No, because my Bible says that if you'll refuse to acknowledge me before men, I'll refuse to acknowledge you before my Father. Hey, we got enough dead people on the roll. Amen. Progressive relativism. If we could just relate to them, if we could just make it easy for them. Well, let's see. My Jesus, He took the easy way, didn't He? Oh, come on. You mean He actually did hang on a cross? You mean he actually did get pierced in his side? You mean he actually did 
have a crown of thorns on his head? You mean he actually did get hit so many times in the face he didn't even look like a man? You mean that his back was plowed? Because that's what the Bible says. It wasn't just beat, it was plowed. You ever seen plowed ground? That's what it looked like, people. That's what his whole body looked like. That sounds like the easy way out, doesn't it? I don't think so. You mean he was raised again? Yes, he was. And I got news for you, and he's coming back. And he ain't coming back as a little bitty baby. He ain't coming back as a carpenter. He's coming back as the minister of war from heaven. That's what he's coming back. And that's just what he tells these people right here. He said, I'm coming back and I'm going to bring my sword with me. And it cuts both ways, long and deep. He says, you have these Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. The Nicolaitans was a sect of people that desired to rule the church. I didn't say they were priests. I didn't say they were deacons. I didn't say they were pastors. They were a sect of people that desired to rule the church. Paul ran up against them in Ephesus. Paul found them in two or three different places. John found them in two or three different places. They were people that may very well have been, may very well have been saved. But at some point they had turned. They had left their love. They had left who they were in Jesus Christ. And they had decided that they wanted their way in the church. Now, I, I, I praise Lord that I don't serve under a man like that. But I have. And they decide what happens in the church. They don't leave it up to Jesus. They decide what happens in the church. They don't leave it up to the body. They decide. I have seen them stand in pulpits and say, you may not fit here. You need to go. Far be it from me for ever saying that. Because in my Bible it says this is God's church. Not Mike's, not Brother Allen's, not Miss Linda's church. Not Brother Tony's church. It's God's church. And I'm going to add something here and this ain't going to cost you a dime. I have heard pastors stand up and say, Touch not God's anointed. Touch not God's anointed. I got news for them. They better read their Bible. And don't say it in front of me. Because my Bible says that this body, this body is the anointed. Who got anointed in the Old Testament? Priest and kings and prophets. And my Bible says that we are a nation of priests and king and prophets in this world today. Amen. They, this body is the anointed, not the man that stands up here. Brothers and sisters, many of y'all, and I appreciate it, and I know Brother Allen does, many of y'all highly regard and respect us. And I appreciate that. And, and men that devote their lives to preaching the Word and do it in truth, need that respect. We need your encouragement. Many of y'all say so many nice things to us and bless us in so many different ways, I can't even begin to tell y'all those things. But when we start doing it for that, we're doing it for the wrong reason. Verse 16, repent. Well, that's pretty plain. When you repent, what do you do? You change your mind, okay? You're going this way and you say, I don't want to go that way. That's not the right way. You turn, you stop doing what you're doing, you turn and you start doing what you're supposed to be doing. That's repentance, okay? Uh, now get a picture of this. It's repentance, if you're going this way and you stop doing what you're doing, but you don't turn, that ain't repentance. Preacher talked about it this morning. Jesus said, repent. 
<coughs> or else. Now, that sounds like a threat, don't it? But it's a promise. There ain't no threat. Jesus don't make no idle threats. You know, I, I've, years ago I used well, I ain't going to go there. But anyway, <laughs> I've had some people make some threats to me. And all I told them was, don't, don't make no threats, you can't back up. Because years ago, I was the one you'd have to back it up to. If you're going to threaten me with something, you better get ready to come on with it. That's all there was to it. Now, God, I ain't like that no more. Well, maybe not all like that. <laughs> or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them. Look at that. There's two pronouns used there, thee and them. He tells it to the church. He said, "I'm on, repent or I'm coming to you. But those of you that don't believe, those of you that are embracing these doctrines, I'm going to fight against you, them. That's who he's talking about. He said, I'll fight against them with the sword of my mouth. That's that double-edged sword. Cuts two ways. Long and deep. That's the way it cuts. Had a man taught me years ago how to use a knife. I'm not bragging about it. They used to call him Doc, and it wasn't because he had a doctor's certificate. He had put so many people in the emergency room getting sewed back up, they called him Doc. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh. How do we overcome? Through the blood of Christ and the word of our testimony. That's how we overcome. The blood of Christ and the word of our testimony. To he that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna and will give him a white stone and in the stone a new name written which no man knoweth, saying he that receiveth it. Jesus, Look at what Jesus says here because this is some rich stuff right here. He says, To him that overcometh, to those that have the testimony of Jesus Christ, what He's done in their lives. He said, I will give to eat of them the hidden manna. Now the hidden manna was a picture of Jesus Christ. In, in the Old Testament, there was a jar of manna placed in, in the uh, ark, the ark of the covenant. It was placed in there and it was a picture of Jesus Christ. This in the New Testament is a picture of, of how we get hold of Jesus Christ. And how we take hold of Jesus Christ. And how we can go with Jesus Christ and sit in a spot away from everything and consume Him. The bread of life. The hidden manna. He says, I will give to Him to eat of the hidden manna and will give to Him a white stone. Now who needs a white stone? Apparently we do. Amen. <laughs> the white stone, there, there's some commentators that believe it refers to the diamond. I, I don't believe, and I told you that, you know, if it was something that I believed, I would tell you if it was something commentators said. It, the Bible is unclear about what this white stone is. But let me, let me explain something to you. Having read all this and talked about the different things and the different consuming banquets... Eating things sacrificed to idols, uh, turning uh, lasciviousness, uh, turning to a life of lasciviousness and, and being involved in different things. I believe this is a reflection, and, and talking about the overcomer, I believe it is a reflection of, of who we are when we win the race. I believe that's what it is because during this time frame at Pergamos, what they would do when you won in the Olympics they would give you a stone, a white stone, with your name on it. And after all the games were over with, they would have a banquet. And if you were the winner, you got to go to the banquet. Now does that sound like something that might be happening in heaven sometime? Amen. He says, to those that overcome, I'm going to give you this stone. And this stone is going to have your name on it. But you see, that, that stone's not going to have Mike's name, my, my name. It'll be the name that Jesus gives me and then relative to his name. 
who he is and how he has changed me and made me new. And it's a picture of the overcomer. It's a picture of how I won the race. You see, y'all in here, every one of y'all in here are going through different trials. Jesus, all these names that we saw earlier, God and Jesus is special in each and every one of those names to you depending on what it is you're going through. You see, I don't know what all of you are going through and you don't know what I'm going through. But Jesus knows. And when He hands you that stone, He'll have that name written on it. And you'll look at that and you go, (laughs) He knew exactly. He knows exactly what I went through. He empathizes with us. Not not sympathizes. He, he He is sympathetic toward us and towards the things that we go through. But with diagnosis of cancer, with broken marriages, loss, of children or loss of loved ones. He empathizes. He has has that ability to bring it from his gut. And when we get this new name, we will understand that he understood. And we won't understand it until we get there. We'll understand it by and by. He says... He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. We'll finish up on this. This church was allowing relativism to slip in. They were taking things that they shouldn't allow into the church. They were believers. All of these letters are letters to believers. Years ago, I worked with two men on the railroad. They were brothers. Now these old boys were raised up over here in Sabine River Bottom. They were commonly known as river rats. They were raised up in the 30s and 40s. So they didn't have video games. They didn't have pinball machines. They didn't have any of that stuff. So they figured out the best way they could to entertain themselves. Now, boys that were raised up in the woods like they were, they could find some entertainment. They had a big old boar coon in their house. Their dad let them keep it in their house. They had hardwood floors. Okay, not the kind of hardwood floors we have here. These hardwood floors, where the knots are right here, were holes. They had holes. So if they were walking through there, they could look and they could see the ground. Now their mama, she would put down these nice little carpets. They were cheap because they were very poor. Their dad would take these big old large marbles. We used to call them jumbos. And he would put them in these knot holes. Now this old coon, oh, he loved sticking his paw down in them holes. He loved it. And when he would get over there and he couldn't get his paw in them holes and them big old marbles was there, he'd try to rake them marbles out. Of course, he couldn't get them out because they were flush with the floor. Well, these two brothers, being exceptionally full of themselves like they were, decided one day to slip underneath the house and push one of those marbles out. And they laid there underneath that house. Now this, this big old boar coon, this is a story they told. So this big old boar coon, he would, you would see him out and he'd be on the porch and everything else, he'd be running. He said, and you could watch him and you could see it in his eyes. He'd, he'd think about that marble and there he'd go. 
he'd go back there and it was in their bedroom underneath the bed. Well, anyway, they pushed that marble out. Well, wasn't too long till they heard that coon back there. And oh, he'd growl and he'd run his hand down in there and he'd just growl and he'd pull it back out. And he'd run his hand down in there and he'd growl and he'd pull it back out. Well, they heard that coon in there doing that, so they slipped underneath the house. And they took a string. And when that coon run his hand down in there, they slipped that string around his arm. Now, I don't know what y'all know about coons, but when they're trapped, they lose their bodily functions. And when he could not get away from there, he lost his bodily functions. He went to flipping and to turning. Now, these boys, mom and daddy, had just bought a brand new bedroom suit. And they had brand new sheets and curtains and everything else in there. That coon made a mess. They said they never did get the smell out of that house as long as they was living there. What was going on? What was going on in this church? They had allowed some things like that coon. They had allowed some things in there and they were putting their hands in there, feeling of them. They wasn't real serious about it at first, but it eventually got to be doctrines. You understand? See, at first it was just deeds. They were just running back there and they were sticking their hand in the hole and it was fun. But all of a sudden, something got them. You see, when sin takes hold in a church, it makes a mess. And it makes a stink. And it messes up everything. And boys, and boys got a whooping. I didn't say a whipping. I said a whooping. And their daddy, their daddy knew how to lay a whooping on them. Today it'd be called child abuse. He said, Mike, he took the reins on our plow and he knotted them up and he beat us till he got tired. You see, they had to face judgment. It was just fun for them until that coon made a mess. Jesus says there are certain things you don't mess with. And bringing sin into a church is something He doesn't tolerate. And it's something that we don't need to tolerate. Now, tonight, if you're here and you haven't trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you need to put your life down and take Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior placing everything you are in Him and taking everything that He is into you and living for Him. That is eternal life. That is life on the next level. But maybe you're like these people were at Pergamos. Maybe you've been playing in the hole and you've been running your arm down in there and you're playing with something you shouldn't have never played with. And it's got hold of you. Or it's going to get hold of you. Maybe you need to come down here and do what Jesus said. Repent. Or else I'm going to come to you and I'm going to judge you. And that's not a threat. That's a promise. Let's pray and then we'll have a little invitation. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word that it's relevant. Father, and that it exposes things that maybe we can't see. Maybe even things we don't know, but maybe tonight there's someone here that hears what you say to the church. Father, I pray that we would be that bride, that spotless, unwrinkled bride. And that, Father, that you would see in this church a holiness and a desire to serve you an ability to, to set things aside and follow hard after You. Because, Father, we recognize that it's Your grace. We recognize that it's, it's Your faithfulness that directs us and keeps us. Father, tonight I pray that You would give strength, boldness, and courage to anyone here that needs to make that decision. 
And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand, please.